case of scholars or in the case of really scientific men, it may be, there may really be such a thing as an impulse to knowledge, some kind of small independent clockwork which, when well wound up, works away industriously to that end, without the rest of the scholarly impulses taking any material part therein. The actual interests of the scholar, therefore, are generally in quite another direction. It is the family, or in money making, or in politics. It is, in fact, almost indifferent at what point of research this little machine is placed, and whether the hopeful young worker becomes a good philologist, someone who studies the abortion, or is a mushroom specialist, or a chemist. He's not characterized becoming this by this. He's not characterized by becoming this or that. Nietzsche's point there, fundamentally, is that even when you do analyze people in whom the, the will to knowledge might actually be operative, even though he wouldn't be willing to grant it the status of highest motivating power, that even in those people where that will to knowledge does exist, the probability that that is in turn subordinated to some other principle that's higher in the value hierarchy is very, very high. And it's hard to tell exactly what that additional principle might be, but he points out such things as, well, maybe they're primarily interested in serving the interests of their family, or they're primarily interested in making money, or maybe they're primarily interested in status, and maybe they're interested in status, status becomes a, because it makes them more sexually attractive, and that sort of thing. So, but the question of what is it that's lurking in the background is always paramount. So, another detour in this particular paragraph. Whoever considers the fundamental impulses of man with a view to determining how far they may have here acted as inspiring genii or as demons will find that they have all practiced philosophy at one time or another, and that each of them would have been only too glad to look upon itself as the ultimate end of existence and the legitimate lord over all of the other impulses. That's another, like, the beyond good and evil, to think of it as a book is a really foolish framework. You know, because this is what a book is when people think about a book. You know, it's like a material entity. It's, it's eight inches high, and six inches wide, and two inches thick, and weighs a pound, and it's made out of paper, and it's between two, two covers. You know, and that's a materialist. That's the a priori sort of axiomatic view of a book. But Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil isn't a book at all. It's a series of bombs, and each sentence is a bomb. Each sentence blows things up that people don't even know exist. And so one of the things that this sentence, for example, here's how he's conceptualizing the human being. So the first thing he talks about is that the there are fundamental impulses of human beings. Okay, so that, that begs the question is, well, what do you mean by impulse? And what do you mean by fundamental? And both of those are extraordinarily complicated problems. So an impulse think of an impulse as a drive. You can think about it as a biological instinct. <clears throat> you can think about it as an aim or a goal. You can think about it as an act of will. Like there's, there's endless questions that, that hang off that question, but we can start with the idea that we perhaps can't define it, but we are willing to go with the proposition that people do have impulses. And I think maybe that's manifest to you more, most particularly <clears throat> when you're attempting to do something voluntarily and something involuntarily interferes with that, you know, so maybe you're sitting down to, to try to get some work done and the work is not of any particular intrinsic interest, but you regard it as necessary, you know, necessary element as a higher order scheme. And so you're attempting to organize yourself so you will in fact concentrate on that particular relatively mundane activity. But what you find when you sit down to actually engage in that is you can't do it. You have to go do the dishes, or you have to clean under the bed, or you have to have a sexual fantasy, or you, or, or there's some other thing that you could do that's 
useful but that you wouldn't normally do that you'll go do instead or that you fall asleep or that you get hungry or like there's an endless number of let's call them impulses that might arise to interfere with your conscious movement forward well exactly what are those things well Nietzsche certainly conceptualizes the human being as a place where those things live and he does mean live too because he wouldn't refer to them as de demons or or genies without introducing the metaphorical conception of something that lives and so partly what Nietzsche reveals in those sentences is that he conceptualizes a human being as the the dwelling place of spirits and some of them are genie let's say that's the root word of genius that's the terribly powerful thing that exists in the terribly small compartment right that you have to call for it and some of them are demons and demons are things that have their own autonomous will and that generally aren't aiming for the good. So then, so those are all things Nietzsche just lays out as implicit parts of the sentence, so he activates all those ideas, whether you know it or not, in your mind to the degree that you process the sentence, and those things start to take on a life of their own, of their own those ideas. And so, then the, he, he adds another dimension of complexity to that by saying, well, you, you're full of demons and and genes and they're all doing their own thing whatever that happens to be but each of them if left to their own devices would attempt to remake the entire world in their form and so I, I, I thought of this from a, from a narrative point of view from a symbolic point of view in, 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 in old stories in folk tales and fairy tales Cyclops and one-eyed giants. And there's a sexual connotation to that, which is which is apropos that the psychoanalysts would, would certainly point out. But the one-eye idea is that this thing is gigantic and wants one thing. And so that's another way that Nietzsche is conceptualizing the fundamental structure of the human psyche. It's a dwelling place full of one-eyed giants, and they're constantly, well, one thing, one way of looking at it is they're constantly at war. One of them wants to be the largest one-eyed giant and dominate everything else. And then one of the things that, so Nietzsche takes that argument further, and he says, not only is this always happening in human beings, but that if you look at philosophy, what it is, is it's a continual revelation of the attempt of some singular-minded psychic monster, psychological monster, to dominate the entire psychological structure and then the entire cultural structure and the entire world. And then you can, you can see in that the entire religious structure, the struggle of mankind to take this vast polytheistic vision of reality and to organize it into some sort of monotheistic and integrated structure, which you could also consider indistinguishable from the civilizing the impulse that operates in human beings to become civilized because on the one hand it might be a terrible thing that one one-eyed monster emerges to attempt to dominate all the others but then on the other hand there's no difference between that and organizing something because to organize something is to bring it all into a hierarchical structure with some sort of singular value at the forefront and then the question might be, well, what should that singular value be? And then Nietzsche would, that ties the whole argument back into the first sentences that he wrote at the beginning of the paragraph, which is, well, what is it that the philosopher is up to? What is the force that he's serving? What is the unifying impulse? That's another way of looking at it. If there's a unifying impulse, and he's not only fallen prey to some internal demon, if there's a unifying impulse to bring all of this together into some sort of structure, what exactly might that look like? For every impulse is imperious and as such attempts to philosophize. That's part of, that's sort of Nietzsche's idea of will to power in, in its nascent form. Like all of these unconscious entities that inhabit the human psyche all lie. And they're trying to live, they're trying to, they're 
try and climb up the dominance hierarchy and dominate because, of course, that's part of what life does. Let's say from an evolutionary perspective, and this is probably more true for males because they're less effective in their attempts to replicate. The distinction between climbing up a dominance hierarchy, whatever that might happen to be, and success is there may be no distinction at all. And then you might say, well, that just shows that there's nothing but will to power. But <laughs> that still doesn't answer one of the most fundamental questions, is that power in relationship to what? Because that's the question.